So good morning, Lewis. How are you, sir? Good morning. How are you doing, Leonard? Good. It's, uh, good to make good. your We're appointment. very excited to uh, to be speaking with you today, and everything else, of course. I figured I'd answer just a lot of the questions that people had, since there's a lot of I, like I've been answering a lot of questions on Reddit, but a lot of them I'm answering the same question about like, you know fifty or a hundred times. Yeah, over and so over. So if and I over see again. any questions show up that are very common ones, I wanted to uh, go over them here. I'm sure there will be answers to questions and all that, but we also don't have some answers to questions because we are just currently in the in the beginning stages of of responding to this thing and we actually have some more meetings to have and all that what mr rossman has asked me to do is to help him find the right attorney and help him make sure that he gets the right representation and so what i'm doing is uh, acting sort of as an ambassador between his situation which includes all of the you know, it facts about his YouTube channel and, and what he does for a living and all that. And I'll be able to translate that to the legalese that I need to speak to the right trademark litigator and say, hey, here's a situation that we're dealing with. And hopefully between the uh, two or three of us, uh, or three or four of us, depending on how you look at it, we'll be able to challenge the, what is it, one of the largest capital uh, capitalized companies in the world, Apple Computer. Yeah. That sounds about right. So uh, I guess a lot of the questions that I've been asking are, you know, how would you import these? What were they advertised as? Why don't you import? Uh, why don't you just buy them like you're supposed to? And just to get everybody caught up who are not aware. Yeah. Uh, if I go to an Apple store and I say, you know, here's $100,000. Can I have some batteries for my store? They will say no. Depending on the age of the machine, some of the batteries I offered are still offered. Some of the batteries that I purchased are batteries that you can, even if you're an Apple authorized service provider, if you, as an Apple authorized service provider, say, here's $100,000, please give me batteries so I can serve these customers. They say, no, it's vintage. We can't help you with that, which is something that actually just changed one or two days ago, which is pretty interesting. Hmm. Uh, but that's something that for like the last five or 10 years, if something's old enough, even if you're authorized, you cannot get access to it. Now, I understand that there are a lot of, because people have been saying, you know, do you care about the quality of what you're importing? Don't you know these are batteries? They could be terrible. They could have bad life. They could explode, um, as I'm well aware of. But uh, one of the things is that there, this, this, it's a problem that was created by the company by saying, we're, never, we're not going to sell you these parts. If you're authorized, we're still not going to sell them to you if it's past a certain age, even though customers still want this stuff. So what I will do, is I, there, there are several classes of batteries. So there's usually complete knockoff, trash, they weigh one-fifth the original, they die in two or three months, they're everywhere on eBay and Amazon, and nobody wants these. Then there are uh, pulls from machines that were, let's say, demos, you know, the, the stuff that's sitting in the store when Radio Shack used to exist that you could walk in and try out. These have virtually no cycles on them, and those are used pulls. There are batteries that are new that claim they came from the original factory that made them for like the Apple Foundry factory that was making them for Apple. Those are typically the ones that you want to go for because they're going to be as good as possible. There are refurbs where somebody will take cells that are the same quality as the re original and, uh, you know, reset the uh, reset the firmware inside the battery. So it thinks it has zero cycles and put those in the case. And there are good knockoffs where it doesn't have any sort of Apple logo or branding. It's completely aftermarket, but it's somewhat, uh, but it is a good battery. So what I do is I will ask some, you know, a trusted vendor, say, listen, I don't have the time to figure out for this specific model at this time what is available and what is the best. You're the one in China. I'm willing to pay you top dollar because I use these for repairs, not mostly resale. So most of the money comes from, you know, somebody paying 400 for a board repair and I have to throw in a battery. I don't care if it costs me an extra three or five dollars to get a good battery. So find me whatever is the best. I don't have the time like every single week to figure out which is the best available. Is it the used pull? Is there original foundry factory one available? Is there one from a, is the, is it the knockoff one that's available? Is it the good? No, I don't have the time for that. So I'll ask somebody to find me whatever is the best available at the time. And this is what they find me. Now, what I find interesting is when you import something with an Apple logo, they'll say, listen, this is saying that it's Apple when we did not authorize it to be sold to you. Even if I disagree with it, I can understand them saying, You're re this is represented as an Apple part. I don't know who you are who's getting it. I'm going to take that from you. But what's really interesting with this case is that they will typically block out any logo. So let's say there was a factory that was making these for Apple that also made some for other people uh, that were willing to pay for them. 
they will block out all the logos. Now what's being said is, hey, I know that you're not even representing this as an Apple battery anymore. You took our branding off of it. We're still going to take it from you. And that's what is really egregious, and that's what made me decide I am willing to spend whatever amount of money it takes to just to get to the bottom of this. Because this, because if, if it's represented as an Apple, you can't have it. If it's not represented as Apple, you still can't have it. It's the yeah. What am I supposed? What am I supposed to tell customers? Like just you know, duct tape a bunch of double A's together and put that in your computer. I you know I I don't understand what the answer here is other than just throw it away and buy a new one. So that's what the, now the uh, and the second thing is a lot of people have said, well, you don't actually know what is in that box because you have not received it yet, and that is correct. I am inferring what is in the box based on what I have received prior to the seizure for several years from this individual and what I received after the seizure from that individual and from what I've heard from them. So they've said, we sent you the same thing that we've been sending you this entire time, and they continued to send me batteries after the seizure, and they were sending them before the seizure. So I'm inferring and assuming that what's in that box is the same thing. For all I know, there, are, there could be a bunch of you know, dead pigeons or Cheetos inside of cases that say Apple, and I wind up looking like a complete fool for filing the case. Yeah. But I think that that's not very likely, and I think it's worth it to assume based on Apple's prior actions, based on the suits they're making in other countries, based on history with my supplier and their history, that this is just the case of them saying, oh, looks like it goes into an Apple computer. I'm take, uh, oh, it may, it may have had a logo that they scratched out. I'm taking that. I had a question for Leonard, and it's okay if you don't know the answer to this yet, um, but I guess... There might be some confusion about what Apple's role in the seizure is versus um, Borders and Customs. Until I hear more, I'm doubling down on my answer from my last video that I, at this time, don't know that Apple had sort of a you know, an APB out on Lewis. It's possible, and we might find out that they did. But at this time, there is a normal reason why batteries might be seized, even just a one crate of batteries or one shipment of batteries. They do spot checks. They often miss a lot of stuff. But Customs and Border Protection is also the second largest revenue generating entity for the U.S. government behind the IRS itself. 30 plus billion dollars of tariffs and fees a year and all that. And this is exactly the kind of thing they do is check these things. So this could be routine or this could be that uh, Mr. Rossman is being targeted by Apple because of his views or, or, or policies of, of repair. It's it's I think if I had to like look back on it, it's more most more possible that it was some sort of random spot check. But I would say that it's uh, that I think that Apple, most, I th if I had a guess, pushes customs more to check for their stuff than other companies are, because I don't see this happening as much. Somebody just mentioned in my chat, uh, you know, you don't understand the law. What you're doing is illegal. It's gray. This is a gray market, and, uh, and that's that's not exclusive to Apple. But what is particularly exclusive to Apple, in my opinion, is creating an entire ecosystem where this problem exists to begin with. Where if you want Again, other companies are going to say, you know, why are you importing not uh, something for our product that's not authorized by us? But other companies are not siphoning off the solution so that you you can't have a solution. Yeah, other other companies are not creating this problem where you cannot get the only answer is buy a new one for a lot of the products and then simultaneously saying if you import something, uh, we're we're not going to allow it. Yeah, there definitely has to be some answer in between there. Um, and I'm hoping that we'll be able to find that answer in this as well, that there is, that this, that this will be a situation where the batteries may have been shipped improperly, or maybe they're always shipped improperly, and the uh, Customs Border Protection just caught it this time, or maybe they're always shipped properly, and they're just doing this spot check, and they're, and overstepping their boundaries. Uh, we'll, we'll, we're going to end up finding out, um, very shortly here, I think. I guess there's one way to find out, and I'm willing to go ahead and see how the case goes, because I figure it's either this, or I just accept the fact that I have to tell people, sorry, your battery's dead, duct tape a bunch of double A's together or buy a new one. Well, ultimately, I don't think it's illegal to import or have someone make a replacement battery for Apple. This The, the, the question is, at what point does it become an Apple trademark issue? 
if uh, so, we're going to be investigating the, the exact source of these batteries and the condition that they were shipped and uh, what labeling is on them and, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And that should give us a lot of clarity on why customs seized this particular shipment of batteries or not. It'll, or, or it might reveal that, that it's as gray as we hoped it wasn't. Yeah, or again, or or we could figure out that they shipped me batter, uh, you know, batteries where they didn't cross out any logos. They look like Apple batteries, and they're filled with Doritos. I, it's completely <laughs> possible that at the end of this, I look like yeah. A complete, not a what jacket. I'm what I'm I'm wondering if it's going to be a situation that's that's really on the line where it's uh, say quality batteries, but it's arguably you know really on the line and, and you could say well apple should be able to control what batteries come out of the factory but you know they shouldn't be able to say that it, that lewis can't order batteries that are of the same specifications and in a high quality at that but otherwise don't have apple branding or logos so i have a feeling it's going to be an answer that that or i have maybe not a feeling but i'm 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 hoping it's not going to be but i have a i sort of have a gut feeling that it that it could be something that's not going to be a nice answer for Apple or Lewis, but uh, we'll certainly cross that bridge if we get there. Yeah, and I, I mean, it, it is possible that this winds up making uh, me look like a complete idiot, or it's possible that it winds up making them look incredibly uh, yeah. petty. Like, there was this one idea that uh, that uh, my friend Jess had had of going to China, oh, wait, buying a bunch of iPhones at the Apple store, going to China, after going to China, uh, talking, you know, taking them apart and sending the parts to a bunch of uh, a bunch of repair shops saying that they're Apple OEM screen, Apple OEM battery and seeing what happens because one of my friends who visited recently had a, a seizure at his store by by uh, one of the agencies and they said, "Yeah, if we, see, we we don't check for it if we see the logo that they got to figure out to get rid of that damn sound uh, that that they will uh, that they will seize it." So and uh, that's that's interesting to me. And this is the difference between counterfeit products and aftermarket products. If you buy a genuine Apple product and take it apart and sell the parts, you're absolutely allowed to do that. Um, whether you can then export import those eh, becomes a different issue depending upon the country's laws. And honestly, I'm not familiar enough, back to that that uh, rule one one competence, I'm, I'm not, I don't know exactly where the law is on there. So I have to do uh, my research and in, in, in acknowledgement that I'm a copyright attorney and that I can guide Lewis through this, but uh, it'll be better to have an expert for the actual litigation part. We're going to be hiring uh, an expert litigator. Now, in the law, I'm not supposed to say expert or specialist because part of, believe it or not, that rule 1-1 one, one competence is that any attorney can become competent. So if I say expert or specialist or something like that, that sort of forecloses the the the, the, the your thinking it forecloses your thinking on well other attorneys could be experts or specialists as well so we're only allowed to say things like we're certified in something if we're certified uh, i think there's one or two very special certifications that get to call themselves experts in certain kinds of law but it's very rare so uh we're going to be hiring an a a we'll, we'll put i'll put it this way this is how attorneys get away with it well, I'll be, I'll be hiring an attorney who focuses their practice on international trademark litigation and deals with customs and border protection all the time. And that, I think, will be the way for us to go here. Uh, all right. So what would be the difference between, let's say, what you would be covering what and the secondary uh, second attorney would be covering? The, the, well... For those uh, who don't yeah, when you originally contacted me, um, you had said, hey, you know, I, I know Leonard French from YouTube and Leonard French probably knows me pretty well and I would understand Lewis's business and all that. And I'll be able to translate that for the attorney that we do hire as the litigator. And I often like to tell clients that this usually saves money because I won't, we won't be doubling up work. I won't be spending a lot of time doing something I'm not competent in and becoming competent in it. Um, nor will we be spending a lot of time getting the litigator up to speed on what Lewis does because we're going to be translating that as efficiently as possible. So I'm more or less the attorney finding the attorney that will do the actual litigation. Yeah, uh, that, that makes sense. One, one thing that I, that a lot of people seem to be asking is, uh, why don't you buy the one that doesn't have a logo? And one of the things I would absolutely love is to be able to actually pay extra to tell the factory while you're making this, is there, can you, can you just, instead of like 
having it removed later, can you just, oh yeah, it would be nice to be able to not have to deal with the logo nonsense altogether. I don't want to actually represent this as an Apple battery. I want to represent it as a battery that will work in a Mac computer. And uh, the reason we didn't buy the ones that don't, that, that where you don't have to cross out a logo is because those are typically made by another factory that's making the stuff that's like a quarter of the way to the original that works like crap. So a lot of people are thinking, you know, you're trying to do this because you want to represent a battery that was not made by Apple's factory as made by Apple's factory. And it's the exact opposite. I'd like to get a battery that's exact same quality, but I do not want to represent it as that. Like the fact that they're, you know, what I don't understand is why they would put the logo on there only to then have to cross it off or scratch it out if the goal is to make it look like it was the original. I mean, the, it would just make sense there to not cross it or scratch it out to begin with. Um, I've probably gone over that point like four or five times already, but I guess the next time I see it asked, I can just tell somebody to rewind. Yeah. Uh, what are the questions that, uh, are there any specific questions that your viewers had concerning the case or? Uh, we have a whole bunch of questions. I'll have to go through and look through our document really quick. Give me a couple oh, minutes. Boy. All right. This should be fun. No, my main questions right now are, are getting to know the exact origin of the batteries, whether they're brand new, whether they're taken out of, of otherwise broken Apple products and, and then repackaged so that they can be shipped to Lewis for, for reinstallation in other Apple products. Uh, there's uh, several scenarios here, and I'm not exactly sure how they each play out, but uh, my gut feeling is that it's perfectly acceptable to remove batteries from broken products and put them into, uh, you know, test them and put them into into other products. Mm. It would be maybe a, a, a more gray line or even maybe a violation if a factory is making Apple uh, batteries with Apple logos that are brand new, and instead of selling them to Apple, which is you know their primary supplier or, or they're the primary supplier for or something, they're selling them to Lewis. Uh, that is going to depend on what agreements and what country and what laws and all that, and we'll have to see how that plays out. And I can't really guarantee you know what, what, whether it's going to be one way or the other. What we're going to do is figure out the best way to get through it and uh, and the best way to, I don't know, show everybody, uh, you know, with Lewis's permission, of course, how international customs and border protection works with regards to these kinds of things, because this is a big deal. I had no idea that Apple could just declare certain products vintage and say, we're not going to repair them anymore. And then your product is just gone. Like you can't do anything with it anymore. I had no idea that they would even yeah. do that to their customers. Uh, yeah, they do. Oh, I was just watching, I was just talking about this in the last stream. Um, I was just watching the, the, Steve Jobs video where he talks about what happens when companies get too big and they and, and they the product people who are so centered on making the product a good product lose power to the marketing people and the and the, and eventually the marketing people take the company in the wrong direction because they sort of assumed that the that the product was going to stay great and they didn't have to focus on that. Yeah, and the really and, ironic. Uh, what you said and the thing is I completely understand why they don't want to stock parts for something that was came out seven or eight years ago. That's going to terribly increase the cost of the product because if you know that you have to stockpile a bunch of parts that you may or may not sell for 10 or 15 years, then you're going to charge the user up front for it. I, I, don't, I completely understand why they say we don't want to stock stuff for something that came out in 2009. Screw that. But what, what bothers me is that you don't want to stock it. If I stock it, I get in trouble. Clearly, if this product is considered vintage and somebody is still making it, that makes something that, to me, looks, appears, if I open it up, seems ver identical to the original. Somebody out there is willing to make this. The materials exist to make it. Users want it. You don't want to make it for completely reasonable reasons. Why can't I? <laughs> And like, and I understand where people will say, well, you know, it hasn't gone through this testing or maybe it, you know, what if it's bad or what if it blows up? You know, the, the think of the children argument. I can get that. But then what is the solution? There needs like, to be a solution. That is the overall message here is that you can't just have a, a, a complete elimination of a post-sale repair economy at the will of the manufacturer. That's some kind of government authority, not not commercial 
business. Like that's yeah. that's monopolistic. That's powerful. That's not that's not capitalistic. Yeah, and perhaps you know the the answer is that somebody who was uses the think of the Trojan argument is you need to get no you need to get those ones on Amazon that are you know the one that weigh a quarter of the original that last just until your A to Z guarantee claim comes up and. I've been doing this for, I've had the, this business for 10 years. I've had the store for almost seven years now. I know exactly what I'm going to get if I buy one of those batteries that they're garbage and the customer is going to hate me and I don't want to give my customer garbage. Um, you, you know, it's, it's not, it's not about saving money. It's, it's pointless because if you buy one of those, they're just going to come back for warranty in two months. It doesn't matter what, what money you save. That, that's not what I want to give people. Somebody asked, can you ask Apple to certify your batteries? That's an interesting one. Um, aside from the fact that they'd probably refuse, they would probably charge a, a fee. If they were being, if if somehow they were being reasonable, they would charge you a modest fee to just recertify that the battery is within spec, and they'd put it on a charger like I do, discharge it once or twice, measure the the, the capacity in both directions, and make sure that it's within spec. And that's that's about it. Like there's really not a whole lot more to do. They, if I were them, I wouldn't even want to do that because like, why am I yeah. wasting my time to help somebody else make money? At the you know, same I, time, I that test is not a complicated test that needs to be performed by Apple certified chemical engineers. That is a test that, that, that anyone can perform with a very simple piece of equipment because quality lithium ion batteries degrade in a very predictable way and there really is no test beyond testing their specifications, making sure they discharge at the proper rate and, and recharge at the proper rate and don't get warm when they do so and don't present a higher resistance than they're supposed to be. And that's it. Like it, it, this is a very simple thing that anyone can do if, if Apple would just get out of the way. Yeah. And I do wonder, you know, there has to be some sort of in between here where you can, ha I can buy something like this and there's some person or some agency or some standard that says, oh, yeah, this looks like it's not going to blow up like Lewis's last e-bike. I'll take it. And, I, you know, I, I'd like to find that. Or come out, or, you know, I'd like to find what that is rather than just toss away. So I am curious what your list of questions are. Yes, and, uh, um, be, I'm going to try to wrap up four or five of them into one here. And the question is, uh, th things seem to be changing really quickly over at Apple right now. Um, do you think that that's a result of of you making a stink about this? And um, and do you think that that's going to affect the case in it? Uh, I don't know if that if that's really because of me. I wouldn't accredit it to me. You know, there are changes that they've been making dating all the way back to 2013. So the iPhone 2, 3, and 4, there was no option for in-store screen replacement. They would just swap out the entire phone for $299. With the iPhone 5, they actually became somewhat competitive. You could get the screen replaced in-store for $109 to $129, I believe, at the time. Uh, I could be wrong. This was like six years ago. But you could get the screen replaced in store with that and, and retain your data. So they've been slowly, like very slowly, becoming slightly more friendly with, with the options they offer. And then there was Apple Care Plus that came out a few years ago where they will help you even if you have accidental damage. You're still going to pay, but they're not just going to throw away your Apple Care because you got accidental damage. So it's been happening in really slow steps. So it's not something that I would really attribute to me because uh, – uh, but it is something that I think it, it will eventually be positive for the customer. The idea that they do have a vintage repair program, the idea that they do have warranty plans that actually cover accidental damage if you're willing to pay for it. These are all good things for the consumer, and I'm happy to see them happening. People in the YouTube chat are mentioning the gray market um, and how uh, importing the batteries might be legal because it's a gray market. Um, what do you think about that? In terms of uh, what exactly about gray market? Yeah, um, They're saying that importing the batteries are is is like a gray market action sort of like in between you know buying them legitimately and buying them completely illegal. yeah gray just means that we aren't sure whether it's legal or le illegal and yeah. that just makes this a harder inquiry because it feels like we're doing something that's allowed to be done and then you might find out that it's technically illegal under some provision of law and that if lewis changes even just one tiny thing about the way he does it maybe it's perfectly legal again uh, so it could be something dumb like that. Well, I would ask firstly, what is the uh, what would they propose the solution is to to it? Is yeah. there and secondly, is there an in between solution to just don't don't import them at all? Yeah, and gray market think, isn't like a legal term anyway. It, 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 we we can't cite that as as a rule of law or anything. Now, like right, one right. of the devil's advocate arguments that I would make for them is, okay, let's assume that the person that's actually making the battery for me 
is the exact same person making the battery for Apple. You know, they've invested in this machinery, they've invested in the parts and the tools, and they don't want it to go to waste because they have stuff left over that they could use to make an, you know, an A1286 2009 battery that Apple's not willing to sell. Let's say that it is the identical factory. One of the arguments would be the devil's advocate arguments that says that would be, well, why not just tell them in the machining process to ensure that any sort of logo is removed so you don't have to cross it out later? I think that would be an excellent argument. Uh, and, mm. you know, it, it's something that, again, if I had the time, if this was on the absolute top of my list of priorities rather than, you know, or, or an incoming queue of 500 things to work on and, um, you know, hiring people and the YouTube channel and everything, I'd, I may ask, can you tell them to stomp that out? And my vendor would go, really? You want me to tell them to remachine their factory for products you're buying 10 to 20 at a time? Really? Yeah. And then I'd go, yes. And then they'd probably say, no, go F yourself. Or maybe they'd say, yeah, sure, we would. So th I think that would be a good devil's advocate argument against uh, what it is that I'm doing. You know, essentially, why don't you just get them to cross all that out to begin with? But the, the, uh, the other thing is, what would, they, what would actually occur if I did that? Because let's, you know, what, what is the difference between simply telling the machinery don't print this text on something that looks identical to the original versus cross out this text or scratch out this text on something that looks exactly like the original. Would it still be uh, seized? Would it still be subject to seizure? So I guess my question yeah. to people who are saying that is what is your solution? If the user cannot purchase the part, if the company's own authorized distributors cannot purchase the part, and the re third party repair shops cannot purchase something, is this what, what, what you know, I would just put the question back on them and say, what is your solution? I mean, a lot of the problem rests with the fact that these, these, these factories are located in China and it's really difficult to, uh, to, to, to file a breach of contract charge against them on Apple's end. You know, um, they're importing all this stuff from them and, uh, you know what I mean? There are, yeah. And there are a lot of, of Apple, there are a lot of knockoffs that Apple has to genuinely pursue in China and yeah. elsewhere. So it's, it's not like they don't have a legitimate interest in pursuing knockoffs. Um, but even if the product, the batteries that, that Lewis or any other parts are, are being manufactured in the same facility or whatever, even if that's in violation of contract law between them and Apple in China, that doesn't necessarily mean that that turns it into a trademark violation at the U.S. border. So I, I'm also interested to see whether and whether if or and how that's a connection to this, because it, even even if the batteries are otherwise being manufactured quality, but illegally or something in, in violation of some kind of contract, I still don't see how that makes it a trademark violation so long as the Apple branding is properly dealt with. What, however that is, scratched yeah. off or covered up or something. Yeah, it would be like, this is probably a terrible analogy on a Sunday morning, but if I go out with my best friend's uh, girlfriend and he sees that, is this something where he should talk to that woman and say, you know, why are you cheating on me on his own time? Or is this something where he can call the cops and say, hey, there's somebody at Starbucks with my girlfriend and that's not, uh, yeah. and it's not me, you know, get them. Um, I think that this is something that they have to deal with with their factory, you know, say, hey, we don't want you to sell to that person. You did. We're going in since they and the thing is, they can't my guess. And this is total speculation here. So I could be talking out of my ass is that they can't do that in China because they don't care because, you know, when we, I yeah. was watching this two or three hour documentary and they were saying, you know, the definition of open source in China is, oh, there were papers on a table. So I decided to take a picture of them and start my own company. <laughs> They have a totally different idea of copyright, of trademark, yeah. of intellectual property. Yep. And you are making your trillion dollar company off of the backs of the fact that people work much cheaper in this country that doesn't respect intellectual property, trademark and copyright. And that's cool. Make your trillion. But this is the side effect of it, that some of those people that are getting paid shit in a country whose culture does not respect trademark, copyright and uh intellectual property the country that you chose to do business in that this is how they're going to do business you know every if, if they have stuff left they're not going to say okay the contract says that we need to destroy these cases and destroy this machinery because this machine is out of production and we're not making bad no they're, they're going to say huh we could probably make some money selling this stuff to this guy and we bought all these materials already let's do it and 
you know, a lot of people absolutely their head exploded on Reddit when I said that I don't that that's totally fine with me. And they said, you know, he lied. And there's this one thread in our app where they said he lied about this. Look, he said that he's that he doesn't care about that. And it's like, yep, yep, been saying that for like six <laughs> years now. I'm not really sure we thought that was new or news, but somebody asked whether you can sell the batteries as um, the case being OEM authentic and the batteries not like specifying that when you sell them. Um, would that help to um, kind of alleviate the concerns um, on Apple's end? Yeah, I think that I should not. I should be selling it as a good battery that fits the computer. I should not be selling it as an Apple OEM. Uh, I don't think I do. I'm just saying I don't think I do because I'm just don't want to like have copied and pasted something stupid into a website description at two in the morning that I forgot about. But I'm 99% certain that I don't sell this as OEM or as something that has Tim Cook's blessing. I don't want to sell it as that. I think if somebody is selling it as that when it's not, that that is wrong. Uh, yeah, so, but the thing is, I don't think that that would change anything at all because I'd, I could be wrong here, but I don't think the Customs and Border Patrol agent is going, okay, so he has this stuff. Let me check his website to see if he's yeah. saying that they're Apple. No, I mean, if I were to think about things, you know, one of the attorneys that uh, Leonard spoke with that was highly critical of me, and he made some very good points, was saying, you know, why are we attributing to malice or conspiracy what should just be attributed to the way, you know, ignorance or just a normal process? Uh, I don't think that there is I don't think that they're looking on my website before they seize my stuff and saying it's to see how it is I sell it. I think that there's opening the box and, you know, just tossing it away and then moving on to the next box. I don't think it would make any difference within the current confines of how the law is currently enforced. Yeah, they would. I'm expecting that we'll find out that they just hit you with a notice and then you have to respond. And it even seems like the notice itself has several different ways to respond. Um, two of which look like you can either have a big formal court hearing or you can sort of write stuff down and see what they say first and then have a court hearing later. So I'm sure we'll get more clarity on exactly what the right way to go is in your case. But it does look like it's just uh, they, you know, search boxes and when they see something, they slap a notice on it and go send it off for processing and then go on to the next box. It really may not be a... Um, a carefully thought out thing. Yeah, that, that, that's what I was figuring. Um, question from Joa. I don't know that Joa DeForest, I guess. Um, it's more for Leonard, I guess. Um, do you think that this is going to set any kind of uh, precedent? Do you think Apple's going to change their ways after a, the case, uh, a case like this, if you do end up winning and and uh, getting it established that these these batteries are legal? Uh, best case scenario, obvious. Uh, no way to know whether this is itself going to directly set any precedent. I'm not really getting my hopes or expectations one one way or the other. Um, I hope that this is the beginning of a change or at least another effort in the sea of change that we need in the right to repair cause. Um, you've, you've heard me say it before, I fight for clients, not causes, because we first want to take care of Lewis and if Lewis wants to fight for the cause, that's great, but he needs to make that decision himself. First off, we're going to present him with the opportunity to fix this issue. And if there's an opportunity to fix the issue in a way that's compatible with his desires and the right to repair cause and make some legal precedent and everything, I think, I think the stars are about as aligned as they could be. But we need to wait for those last couple of stars to align before we call this our... Um, you know, a, a bellwether case to lead the flock and, and go to court. I hear a lot of people making car analogies. Well, I can import a car, so what if I repair my car? How is that not a violation? You're, you're more or less right there on the edge of the issue. That is the problem. You can't repair your car sometimes. You can't import repair ports, parts sometimes. Companies have used trademark and copyright to eliminate your right to uh, to get watches, to, like, like, like wrist watches, um, because I think it was either Tissit or, or Tag Hewer or something. Uh, you, you put their trademarks and copyrights on different parts of their watches and then tried to say, well, no, 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 this watch also contains a copyright. So you can't import this watch because it contains it. When the copyright was really just a cover for the import controls yeah i mean so for the car analogy um 
imagine so 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 you, this is apple right and and apple doesn't let uh isn't selling these parts to anybody it's kind of comparable to mclaren um mclaren does not allow allow any repairing except for by their um specific stores did we like there's just watch the york. same video or something like yeah like, yeah okay <laughs> there's one in new york one in la and so, for some of the really really high octane stuff you have to send it all the way back to britain and like Toyota, which is a Japanese company, they send their parts everywhere. Every mechanic can get Toyota parts, right? That's the way that Apple should be operating. And instead, they're operating more like McLaren, where if the part is outdated, too bad. And if it's a car that you can currently maintain, then go ahead, send it to our shop, uh, which could be two, 4,000 miles away from you. And we will repair it on your dime, of course. No, not, we're not going to pay for anything. You have to ship it. You have to pay for the racetrack. You have to pay for everything. It's kind of comparable to that in the car analogy. Yeah. Now, I haven't heard I, I don't I, one way or the other, but I'm assuming that if somebody tried to put non-McLaren wheels onto a McLaren, that'd be okay, but McLaren would wipe their hands of... Oh, no, 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 they actually... So McLaren has... Uh, I don't know if... We watched the same video on Vindu Wiki, right? I, I only paid attention um, to half of it, sorry. That's okay. I, 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 so I embody the watch time statistics. So for, for McLaren cars, they keep a running report of every time that you do maintenance, every time you have a part that isn't McLaren, all of that goes onto a report, and whenever somebody buys a McLaren from somebody else... They can get that report from the McLaren factory, and that will affect the price of the car. Wow. Okay. So they, but they don't stop you from putting a third-party part on your McLaren? They won't stop you, but it will decrease the value of your car. Yeah, and we are talking about a car that costs more than I'll make in a lifetime. I think you'll be able to make get a McLaren in your lifetime. <laughs> I have more faith in you. Oh, thank you. All right. Well, when we have $14 million lying around, you know. <laughs> a used one. Well, you get a used one for $1.4 million. So I'm sure that we will have updates on this as things proceed. I will have more news for Lewis tomorrow morning. Um, and I'm sure that we will decide how information will be released from there. So far, it sounds like we're, we're making a, a sort of a public um, effort of this so that everyone has an opportunity to, to understand what exactly is going on with the right to repair in the U.S. and around the world. So I think that was th two or three questions, but somebody uh, you had said you had four or five written down, or is it that you asked a bunch of them as one question? I yeah, basically people were asking the same question, and I just wanted to bundle them together like that. Um, we do have um, a question from these names are ridiculous. Is customs law incompatible with the first sale doctrine? Uh, is this a, an issue of of first sale be interfering with customs law? Uh, no, there, this is exactly that. It is not an incompatibility. It's that the two operations of law run headfirst into one another, and there is a whole body of law. I started to touch upon it when I was talking about tag hewer and copyright and all that. There is a whole body of law that does allow import controls for intellectual property like patents and trademarks and copyrights, but does run up against the right to repair or the first sale doctrine or other laws. And judges have to decide which law overrides. There's a whole other kind of, of learning in law called conflict of law is a whole topic that you'll study in law school if you go to law school called conflict of laws and how we decide which law overrides when two laws cover the same thing but have a different outcome. So. Uh, some of this is gray. Some of this will involve that that Apple is one of the first companies to push this far with this. Some of this may be established by previous companies who have pushed this far and been overridden, and we just have to translate that law for 2018 and point it out to Customs and Border Protection or point it out to a federal court. And from there, the chips will fall where they may. Hopefully we make some good arguments, and that will... Uh, and we'll be able to preserve Lewis's right to import batteries, or we'll have clarification on the right way to import batteries if this somehow was not it. Uh, either way, I, I kind of see this only being a positive thing. We'll be bringing awareness to the right to repair, uh, protecting Lewis from whatever is, if this is the beginning or end of something or just a one-off, I don't know, and establishing how whatever he needs to know for the future to make this less of a, a risky thing where so he doesn't happen again. Yeah, I mean, even if I wind up looking like a complete idiot because everything was done wrong, if I can showcase to other people what the right how how to do this properly, 
um, I'm happy with the, I'm happy with the outcome. The other the other point that I wanted to drive home was that even if you did this improperly, look how freaking complicated this is. This is not a simple thing where you should have known better and and you know you're an idiot. Um, this is you ordered something that is that you genuinely meant to use as a the highest quality part available and you don't I mean we, we all have this same problem if I walked into Walmart or whatever what was the thing with aloe vera a year ago or whatever everybody was making aloe vera products calling it aloe vera but there was no aloe vera in it including on Walmart's shelves you could buy counterfeit products in the US at Walmart so this is not a problem that that only idiots have this is a problem that happens from supply chains and, and not being able to monitor 100% of your supply chain. Because again, why would you spend that much money flying to China to, to verify all of that, which could still also be fake or, or could be a, a sham or something like that? It is interesting because if it's not something that Walmart thinks that there's a re that makes sense to do with their budget, then I don't see how many people can think it would make sense to do with our budget. Because you know, again, if you're ordering, you know, 50 of some knickknack that you're going to sell in a in a local store that you're making 20 cents on, it just doesn't. It, it, there, the, there's not enough uh, meat on the bone to go through and figure out the entire history yeah. of it and does this infringe on something and. So you, 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 you order something. I mean, I've even ordered, I, I, I build e-bikes for fun as a hobby and I've ordered lots of parts from China because where else makes e-bike controllers except China and now a, a place or two in Canada. Thanks, Justin from ebikes.ca and, um, the adapto controller from Russia is actually one of my favorites, but, um, a lot of it's from China. So, you know, I, I've run up against some of this stuff, never actually had anything seized definitely got an occasional counter counterfeit battery or something but um only when i was ordering from alibaba or aliexpress or ebay also i was curious i had a question about how you blew up your e-bike battery i heard something <laughs> about pulling 90 amps from a 60 amp battery but i was being an idiot so it's a 20 amp motor and a 30 amp battery and i thought let me try 30 and it worked and i thought let me try 45 and, it worked. and then i thought let me try 60 and it worked and i thought let me try 75 and it worked and I thought, let me try 90 in some place where there's not a lot of people around and i did and that was uh, like I, it's not something i would do for any any other people or around other people this should just are be you okay retarded. oh yeah i'm great the, my, my, my bike is a little crispy, but I'm great. That's, that's nice. Wait, was this a genuine battery? Or? <laughs> no, no. Th th these were genuinely good sales. I forget if they were Panasonic or Sony, but yeah. I paid yeah. good money for the battery. It yeah. was just me being an idiot and like pushing it. Yeah, way they, they do have limits pushing. like that. You go past the limits. So they overheat inside. Yeah, I also had plugged in a, a charger that had died into it. So that battery had seen 120 volts of AC instead of 52 volts of DC on input like two or three times. <laughs> <laughs> Which, of course, AC is peak to peak 170. So that's yeah. good, too. And I got that, that charger on Amazon uh, with Amazon Prime. So, yeah, However, I sent out, so that battery has seen 120 volts of AC several times, has seen three times the output current it was rated for. It was just me purely yeah. being an idiot. Depending with, on the current, like, like, that voltage might not actually blow up that battery because it can absorb quite a lot of energy before anything happens. Okay, as someone who has never blown up a battery, can you paint a picture of what that looks like? Like, how do you know that something has gone wrong? You hear a... <laughs> it sounds like that kind of like... It's like a balloon letting out air really fast, but followed with flame and fire. So I've I've lit batteries on fire several times, not from e-bikes or but just from on the newer MacBooks, they glue the battery into the computer. And you have to use a tool to really get that stuff out. And every now and then you're gonna puncture the battery because they don't have the plastic shielding on them. And I have a video on YouTube that says how to replace an A1502 battery, which people can watch. It's security footage of what happens when you um, when you puncture it. So it sounds like a balloon letting loose. It lets out a bunch of disgusting looking gas and uh, and sometimes they catch fire. Yeah, the motor that I got and the battery, everything that I got, they're fine products. They're great products that are totally safe as long as you're not an idiot that tries to push four to five times the rated power through it just for the sake of a hobby, which is what I was doing, which was stupid, but fun, but stupid, but fun. Did you go fast? Oh, yeah. 
I, that was the fastest I've ever gotten to 19.9 miles an hour in my life. <laughs> Acceleration of 19.9 miles an hour was incredible. Yeah. I made one of those with a 5,000 watt motor, and to this day, I'm the only one who has not thrown himself off of it yet. Yeah, didn't Matt recently throw himself off of it and hurt himself a little bit? A little, yeah. Uh, well, that was, we built a, I built a trike out of out of a cyclone, which is like the, um, the Bafang mid-drive, but it's a 3,000 watt motor. And it, the controller is a little twitchy, and I even set the controller on its lowest speed or in lowest torque, and it was still very twitchy. And, and he managed to twitch himself off of it and smack the back of his head on the pavement, and we had to go to the hospital. He was okay. Jesus. <laughs> the only time I've gotten injured on this bike was actually while I was braking. I was going at about 12, 14 miles an hour, and I went over a wet plate, which is silly because like the amount of stupid things I've done on a bicycle <laughs> from the age of 9 yeah. to now... Like there were there were twenty years of me being an idiot on a bike before I even got a motor, and the one time I got in trouble was like you know I remember doing the like trying to skid down the entire block where there was a hill and it was raining. Mm. Can you keep your balance as you skid down the entire block? Like all the stupid things I did when I was twelve years old with other kids, and this is yeah they hurt so it hurts now though. Yeah, yeah, cause <laughs> if you don't heal as fast. Cause, <laughs> 30. Uh, I ditched my one wheel the other day. I was trying to get across the traffic lanes a little bit too quick and nose dived and found myself laying face first in the pavement in the middle of the what road. What is your uh, uh, yeah, primary e bike setup out of curiosity? Oh, I only have about seven e bikes. And, uh, <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> Brandon lived with me for a little bit. He knows what I'm talking about. Yeah, he yeah, has e -bikes, there's e bikes, and every, every room has its own dedicated <laughs> e bike just in case you need to get away. Like, it, it, you always have an e-bike with an arm. They're reach. piled up in one room. Um, now I have I have a little e-bike uh, that I built for my ex girlfriend that I built a custom battery pack for. It goes like thirty five, and I have a off roading bike that's kind of like the stealth bomber. It's like a stealth bomber knockoff, and uh, that's my favorite one. But it's it's a work, always a work in progress. Built my own um, hull effect uh, sensor uh, magnetized e-bike brake. Because the Adapto controller supports progressive uh, regeneration, so you can use the re, uh, the brake lever as as a progressive regeneration brake lever, and it works really really well. And you need a powerful motor for that, but it works really well. And then I have a bunch of like parts of bikes that I basically stole parts from to make other bikes. Um, and I have a bunch of bikes that I bought learning how to make other bikes. I, I, I have a Kelly controller that I've yet to figure out. I keep getting this pedal error on it. Okay. After, but it, it's, it's been on the back burner. Like I only get to, I, I've set a rule for myself. Like every 15 MacBooks, I get to spend a half hour on my bike. <laughs> <laughs> I know that feeling. Those are high quality problems, I guess. Making yeah. money, having it's a job. It's better to be busy than broke. Yeah. And now I have my one wheel, which is the one wheel electric skateboard and I can't get enough of that thing. I love it. It scratches my itch for motorcycling, and I, I'm going to die on a motorcycle, so if I'm not on a motorcycle, that's good. So I ride a one-wheel now. One-wheel is a little scary for me. I'll, tr I'll work myself up to that being that it, brave uh, It took a while to get used to it, but now that I'm, that I'm used to it and, and feel like, uh, like I've got the hang of it, more, more than just the hang of it, I, I really feel like it, we're, in, we're in tune. Um, I've, I've, I've got complete control and I, I feel like I'm just uh, another person just surfing around the pavement. So riding a one wheel <clears throat> is scary for you, but like not putting all of that extra power, like running through the battery for your e-bike, like that was fine. <laughs> it was fine up until the moment that it went on fire and I had to jump off of it so that I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> I was riding along this open area where they were filming some sitcom. I suppose it's because the thing is, I wasn't planning for the fire. That's why it wasn't so as scary. <laughs> People in your chat are like, in court, these guys are just going to be talking about one wheels and e-bikes all day. We're going to sidetrack the court. <laughs> <laughs> I am. Yeah, I had a dream the other day where a prosecutor like took up a picture and said, is this you with a battery that you said was safe? And they have like a picture. <laughs> <laughs> One of the people took a post on Instagram of me jumping off of a bike that is on fire. Oh, Lewis, I don't know if you know, but that something like that happened to me recently. I had a guy try to pull me over in a car and he was not a real cop and it was not a real cop car, but he had red and blue lights and stuff. And when we, he got charged and when he went to the hearing, I got cross-examined and they did all that stuff to me. Like, isn't it true that you went on you? 
YouTube a couple weeks ago and said that he was only doing this for 10 or 15 seconds and what doesn't that mean that this is only a minor thing to you and you should drop this? And it's like, are you kidding me? Like, no. That's that. He pretended to be a cop. You go to jail. Yeah, yeah. N they, nobody else bought it, but that was their primary argument was, uh, was y you said things on YouTube. Well, when he got nothing, really? what else can he do, right? Yeah. It reminds me of that, that last Seinfeld episode where they go over everything that they've ever done that were terrible and they wind up in jail under the Good Samaritan law. <laughs> like, I really hope that that's not the end. Because my biggest nightmare is just somebody quote mining every single thing I've ever said on YouTube. <laughs> playing it in court and them saying, you know what, fuck it. You don't even, forget just, about your just batteries. Just go to jail. Just toss in jail. Yeah. Not even for the batteries. I don't even care about that. I want my MacBook to last a little longer, but you deserve to be in jail. Yeah. Or underground. Uh, whatever, uh, did he, did you end up knowing what that sentencing was, Leonard, or is is there any... Oh, he's not sentenced yet. We He had his arraignment at the end of October. It was a second formal arraignment. Pennsylvania does this thing where we have a, a lower court arraignment, then a preliminary hearing, then an upper court arraignment. And so he's had the formal arraignment now, and I've talked to the prosecutor. Everything looks good on our end, and he will be offered what a, a plea agreement that I have agreed to. And if he takes it, that will be the end of the thing. I'll make a statement in court, and he'll make a statement in court, and then he'll be sentenced probably to no jail time and just a fine. But it will be a charge that would stay on his record and will have some other consequences that I don't want to go over until I know for sure what's going on. But I had a long conversation with the prosecutor, and we're all on board. So uh, everybody's uh, on my, everybody on our end is on the same page. This is not no conspiracy over here. So um, we do have a bit of a naysayer question, if you want, Lewis. Sure. Oh, um, go ahead. Someone's asking. Uh, yeah, someone's asking why? Why? They, 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 these are the exact words. Why are you trying to generate so much hate for Apple? Apple isn't responsible for IP laws, and the laws on this are very similar all around. Hmm. Okay. I suppose um, I don't think I'm trying to generate hate for Apple so much as I'm just trying to show people that this is how they treat consumers in the hope that they start to treat consumers better or that consumers start demanding better. You know, so if somebody walks into my store and is told, because, uh, you know, this product's not working, I went and I say, okay, I don't service that. Go to the company and see what they say since every time it flexes, you get bars in the screen. And the company says that's not happening. And then they, they'll come back to me and they'll say, screw that. I'm never buying that thing again. When it comes to Apple... They'll have a problem that hundreds of thousands of other people have had. They'll go to the store, and the person who is 110% aware that the company is, uh, knows this problem exists and should issue a recall for it will stare at you and say, oh, you know, according to their script, I see that that would be very frustrating for you. Have mm -hmm. you tried this or that? Yeah, we'd, uh, and there's unfortunately there's not much we can do. Would you like to buy another one? And mm -hmm. they will come back to my store with a new, with a new one. And I'll just say, what, what, you, know, what, you, you, said, you, my customer, said, that they screwed you, you admitted that they, you felt like they screwed you, and you just spent another thousand bucks with them. Why? I yeah. suppose that's what it is. It's it's this idea that they that the gaslighting kind of works. That they tell people that oh yeah, the thing that you think is a problem is not actually a problem. It's just you, and that people would not accept that from virtually any other company. Uh, you know, like when Lenovo puts spyware on their machines, I say that that's garbage. I'm not buying this until you fix that. With uh, when HP releases machines with dying GPUs or constantly, people, you know, ten years ago, people will say this company makes crap. I'm not yeah. buying their stuff anymore. But when Apple does it to a user at a premium price tag over every other company, people just kind of seem to accept it. Now, I don't care if somebody uses their products because they work for them. I don't care if they, they're happy that it works for them. Uh, if, if, if you've never had a problem with it, then by all means, continue to use it. I don't care if somebody uses it. You know, uh, like at least three or four of my employees have MacBooks and Apple products. And, you know, they, they'll come and say, oh, my God, I can't believe I have this working for this company. And I'll say, why? If it allows you to do your job, be efficient, and they have not done anything to you to earn your scorn, by all means, keep using it. I don't care. What I suppose bothers me and was when somebody is screwed over and over and over again and they just keep going back like they have the 2010 machine that randomly kernel panics and they're told oh I see that you're coming in for warranty well that is out of warranty because we announced the plan only lasting three years from the original purchase date three years after the machine came out thank you buy again and they buy a 2011 one and that one dies and they're told to buy a new one. And they buy a 2012 one. And they buy the 2012 retin. And that one dies because the board is flexing. And they say, oh, well, it must be something that you did while simultaneously refurbishing the machines by putting a piece of rubber in them that pushes the board to the case in a $3,800 machine. 
It's like every single year they do something like that. And the users, for some reason, just seem to be content with it. So I don't want to make people hate Apple. I simply want to say, this is what they're doing. This is the way that the products are designed at this price. If you want to buy them, go for it. But if you've had these experiences, don't get fooled into thinking that it's you. You know, it's, 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 it's the same frustration that I suppose I have if I had a friend who was being beat by their husband but keeps going back to them. It's like it, it activates that same center of my brain if yeah. that makes any sense. They've tricked their customer base into factoring in replacing their device yeah. every year as part of their budget. Like, that's essentially what it, they're like, oh, well, this has to be replaced every year anyway. It's like, no, it doesn't. It shouldn't. It should last you for many years. Like, this is not something that should be happening. Give me two minutes to tell this story. I actually wasn't going to tell this story because, uh, but then now I realize that I have to tell the story for exactly the, 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 the same reason. The gaslighting that, that Lewis uh, talked about is exactly what happened to me and to, to, with my two uh, iPhone 5, I think it was, had the lock button issue. And I had been taking my phone out of its case because I couldn't get the lock button to press. And I hadn't figured out that there was a software lock button or whatever that you could, that you could press. And uh, I, I dropped my phone and it chipped the very edge of the glass, just the tiniest little chip, barely noticeable. I wasn't really even that upset about it. I went to Apple when they finally announced that the lock button issue was a warranty issue, and they said, no, 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 it'll be $155 to replace your screen, because in replacing your lock button issue, we're going to fix your screen too, and you owe us for the screen. And I said, no, just, just, you know, give me the same screen or, or whatever you need to do. This was your issue, not mine. And that's this, that was the end of my relationship with Apple. However, Anybody I ever told that story to who was already an Apple fan or person thought I was the most nuts person in the world that I expected Apple to fix my phone for free for their own issue, for Apple's issue. My girlfriend told me that, my my two best friends uh, were married to each other from high school, they told me that. And they would always roll their eyes. If they heard me say, I'm going to send them a link to this clip because they're going to roll their eyes so hard, I'm going to feel it from 10 miles away. Because they think that, that, that it's just so weird that I would want Apple to fix an issue they caused. Yeah, you just buy a new one in a year. <laughs> I did. I bought a Samsung. Yeah. <laughs> I've not. I've not bought a single Apple product since then. Except for my phone, but you bought it used. For me, I haven't bought a single Apple product for me since then. <laughs> yeah, the, I think that the, what Apple said there is probably not in, in accordance with the, the the federal warranty act because you know the one issue is unrelated to the other. So, yeah. Anyway, it wasn't even it wasn't cracked either. It wasn't like they couldn't get the screen off. But you know, I'll let I'll, that's an argument I could understand. But uh, the, the whole idea of we're not even going to work with you, you know, just give us $150, you know, no ifs, ands, or buts. If you decide not to do this, well, you just have to go buy another product or, or you know, leave Apple. I don't I just don't understand what happened to working with customers on things. I have this problem with, with, with customer service constantly is that I apparently expect way too much. But uh, it's, things are changing or... I don't know. We just we just don't service customers anymore. Yeah, I mean, yeah. To go back to the to go back to the car analogy, which is everyone's favorite talking points, like, oh, there's some problem in the engine and your door's damaged. It's like, oh, we have to repair the door. It's like one thing has nothing to do with the other. We sealed your hood shut, so you have <laughs> to pay us to open your hood to f repair the broken engine that we that we didn't design properly. And if you don't, you could just go and buy another car. Like, I understand you didn't have to design a hood that latches, but you also didn't have to not design a product that, you know, a, a working engine inside. You, you know, you, you could have made a product that didn't fail inside, then you wouldn't have to open it. But, you know, some of this is a little hyperbolic because there will be failure rates, even on a good product. You'll still have a couple percentage points failure rate. So, yeah, the right to repair is not going away, as I guess the overall point here and why Apple is, is, is pushing so hard against it. I don't actually think it hurts their economy that much anyway. Apparently not. I mean, it, it potentially could if certain things were passed. Again, I'm not asking them to make everything available to me because I realize that that would be a nightmare for them. I'm simply asking them to take to stop putting barriers in place so yeah. that I can't get things that I usually would be able to get. 
you know, is it absolutely terrible if Intersil allows me to buy an ISL 95530 with modern firmware? I get it. You know, Apple doesn't want to stock this. That's fine. Do you have to tell Intersil, like, hey, don't sell to these guys? I mean, that, yeah. that's really the part. I'm not asking Apple to do my job for me. I'm simply asking them to stop putting roadblocks in the way of me being able to service their products. And, uh, you know, going back to the other thing, there's, and that, that there was uh, one good point somebody made when it came to, like, what, you know, it seems like you have a hostile attitude towards Apple, regardless of the points that you made. Um, you know, I mean, for uh, somewhere around 2009 through 2016, when people went to an Apple store, they weren't just told you shouldn't use a third party. They were usually, they were often, my customers, given a list of all the things that would go wrong with their device if somebody but Apple touched it. And that created a sense of fear. I remember people coming to me with this sense of paranoia that like if I open, you know, if I open something the wrong way or if I touch this or if I put this part there, that something could not be done. I remember them saying, you know, if, if they open, if they take this screen out, then it's not, you know, it's not going to work. Or if I, uh, if I replace a component on the board, it's not going to function anymore. Uh, I had, and for me, the real turning point was in 2015 when I went to lobby with Jessa Jones in Albany. And one of the assembly people told me that the Apple lobbyists, I remember going up there with a board and a charger that had a wire across it with some green conformal coating over it and saying this wire allows this customer to save about three or four hundred dollars. Um, and all I'm asking is that the guy that uh, shows me this schematic does not get arrested or whatever or something for, for making it available. And they said, well, the lobbyist told me that when you're doing this, that it's no longer an Apple product, that it is a, a counterfeit product or a PC and not a Mac, and that you're misrepresenting it as an Apple laptop to your customer. And I think so like a, a gasket in my head just exploded when I heard yeah. that because there's where the car the, repair and, analogy works. Yeah. And I, I think that's yeah, it does. But th that's the part that drove me insane. There were two. Firstly, that. The reason that they were able to get away with saying things like that is because we're, we never bother to show up. You know, we're busy fixing things. I don't have time to spend ten thousand dollars a month on a lobbyist to show up and speak for me. So, you know, we never made the time to show up. So they would only hear one side of the argument. But that one side of the argument for so long was ridiculous. If this person touches it, they're going to ruin it. They're going to they're lying. They're misrepresenting a Mac as a PC and giving it back to the customer. I mean, this stuff is all absolute insanity and silly. But you hear that for enough time. And eventually, admittedly, in my head, I'm just like, well, screw these people. You know, th this this is bullshit. This makes no sense. You're fear mongering your customers to keep them from using an alternative. Um, I don't do that. I tell people right now, if you want an iPhone screen repaired, we can do it. But you'll probably get a better deal at the Apple store because you'll get an original part. They'll do the battery for twenty nine dollars. Go there. If you're in warranty and they tell you this price for screen replacement, they'll do the assembly or we're doing just the LCD. If you're a graphics designer, that's the best deal because you'll get a more perfect job. I have no problem saying when somebody else is likely the best at something. But they fear my, they uh, up until 2016 when my when the channel started really getting some momentum, so many people at so many of these stores and genius bars were just telling people things that I found to be ridiculously untrue with uh, the best intention would be uh, keeping the customer from potentially getting ripped off by somebody they don't know. Worst intention, just fear mongering uh, to keep other people from being able to do uh, the jobs that they wouldn't want to do. And it aggravated me. It, it definitely aggravated me for a long time. And one thing I, I do have to check myself on now is making sure that I don't go from trying to uh, uh, get rid of oppression to reversing it or uh, to the point where it's just senseless hate for no reason. And it is something that I do have to check myself on because I do have eight or nine years of them saying ridiculous <laughs> things, uh, fear mongering the customers that walk in the store, yeah. uh, you know, just, and, and listening to these types of ridiculous things. And it is easy to fall into a little trap of just, you know, thumbing up all the comments in my uh, YouTube section that are just all F Apple, this, that, and the other. But I, I would actually, you know, if they would start to be sensible, I really wouldn't mind working with them and uh, opening a real dialogue on how to actually fix these issues instead of just, you know, screaming at, as to how terrible they are. Yeah, but frankly, what you've just described is disgusting. It's just trying to like throw other people under the bus just so that they don't go to you. Like, like, sorry, like yeah. you're not getting this repaired. And if you go to Lewis Rossman, he's going to, he's going to defraud you. And the like, whole repair to, industry really in general. And to give them credit in 2016, that totally turned around. We got ridiculous amounts of referrals from Apple stores because if you're in an Apple store and you're a mom and you're crying because this phone has all your baby pictures on it and they're saying, we can't get it back. Sorry, you're screwed. Buy a new one. 
That, that sucks. You don't want to have that in your store. What you want yeah. to say is, we can't help you, but this guy, if you give him $300, can probably get all your stuff back. Sorry, you got, you got it in water, so you, you know, you're going to pay something. But here, he yeah. can help you. That, that's what they want. And I think that that makes sense. And I, you know, there, are issue, there are lots of things where I'll say, go to Apple. I mean, I email people every day. They, they would be better for this issue. Yeah. Do you, you, have, you have a MacBook Air that randomly crashes that you did not get any liquid on. I don't want to touch that board. Go to Apple. They'll probably fix it for cheaper than me. And it'll be a prop. They'll do it faster. And it'll actually work. I don't want to fix like random crashing on a machine like that. But, you know, but uh, th for the longest time, they weren't willing to give us that benefit of the doubt that maybe there's a better option than spending twelve hundred dollars to get like or two thousand dollars because of a bent pin. And, th and that's what used to aggravate me. And I will admit they've gotten a lot better at it. Again, the local stores, they've stopped doing that. I don't I don't have customers walking in anymore saying the Apple store told me if you do this, X is going to break or I shouldn't use you for this reason. That that has started to go away. But I'm sure in my head, I'm still remembering uh, from, you know, the time that I started in business around 2008, 2009, all the way up until 2016, when I had five or 10 people come in a day telling me these ridiculous stories. And I'm sure that still bothers me. We hear similar things, similar complaints about attorneys. But, you know, I'm sure I'm sure some of those are deserved. Not about you, of course. <laughs> Never. We have a wonderful rating. I am Hippo12 seems to be confused uh, on whether this is a civil case against the Customs and Borders um, to prove that the batteries aren't counterfeit or whether this is a case against Apple Direct. It's a case against Lewis. The Customs Power. and Border Protection has brought a case against Lewis. It's not like a, not like a lawsuit, but it, it is a lawsuit because that's how we do claims and things in the United States. So it's brought as a claim on the property and Lewis is the owner of the property and has to respond on its behalf. Or even, a, a sort of even more accurate assertion, this is a notice that they're going to bring a claim on the property, that they've seized it in preparation for a claim. And now here's the intermediate chance, the in-between chance to say, well, okay, either seize the property or let me explain why you shouldn't, or let's go to court over it, or there's a couple other options. And it would be nice if this got to the stage where, bringing back the car analogy, it's similar to a car where, yeah, you have to replace the battery sometimes. You're not always going to replace it with a Toyota battery or a McLaren battery or Ford battery. You know, you're going to replace it with right. a battery that fits you, you know. And uh, hopefully that this is this this turns into a situation like that where, where that's just acceptable, you know, where where. Yeah, people aren't going to be saying you don't have an Apple product anymore because you put an auto zone, a cheapo AutoZone battery in. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's what they were trying to do in in Norway. There's this one case that I would like to record and visit Norway for in the summertime with uh, Henrik Kuzby. So he was having uh, screens refurbished in China and then sent back to him. It's common because when you drop the phone, 99% of the time the glass breaks, not the LCD that makes the picture. So he'll have the glass replaced in China, get it back, offer that screen to his customer. He can say, this is not a, a knockoff new screen with a crappy LCD. This is the original LCD hmm. uh, with new glass, and it came out of somebody else's phone. And you can offer somebody a screen that looks better than you could otherwise because it's the original. And they said, um, and they were suing him for have, having counterfeit screens put into the phones or trademark or copyright or something like that. And uh, he won, but they're appealing the suit and uh, and they're doing that and that case is going to be held in June and I, I just I don't understand this concept that it's not that you you can't call it uh, an iPhone you, you an iPhone anymore because the screen has been re changed in some yeah way. and I, and I get it you know technically well what if it's not changed to the original specification okay what if I change the muffler on my car with a different one is it not yeah. a Chevy and that does enter an interesting philosophical discussion at what point is a Chevy Impala not a Chevy Chevy Impala at what point is the Tesla Roadster not a Tesla Roadster? Yeah. And I, these are questions that nobody has actually thought about before because we never lived in a world where your mechanic would get in trouble for representing your Chevy yeah. Impala as a Chevy Impala after fixing it if he changed a part in it with one that was not the original. But, at, but now that that question is being asked, it, the interesting thing that I point out is we, we haven't asked this question for like the last 100 years. And yeah. do you yeah. want to apply that question to every single device uh, that you have right now when you pay for repairs on it. And I do appreciate that you're asking the question because I, I saw that in a lot of comments where people don't seem to be asking that question. It's like, at what point does this become a problem, if at all? And, you know, I think it's a very reasonable question. It's the ship of Theseus made real. And it's like, 
what do we do about this? Yeah, I could hear Apple's point of view, which is that, you know, a lot of these screens that are produced are real garbage because yeah. they're not paying, you know, they're not doing repairs. A lot of the people selling these, they're on eBay, where if I'm 20 cents below you, that puts me above you in ranking and I'm going to get 10 times more sales. So there is there is a real incentive if you're a seller on either eBay or Amazon. And I, you know, it, it happens on independent websites, but the price competition on eBay and Amazon is insane. There's a real incentive a real financial incentive to figure out how to shave off that 20 cents because that's going to get you that ranking. And once you have uh, you know, more people clicking to purchasing, that the algorithm will say that you should be higher because you have a greater rate of conversion. So you know, this is the seller that we're going to feature. There's a big incentive to totally throw the quality and longevity and safety under the bus yeah. for 20 cents. And I can understand the counter argument, which is that we don't want our brand associated with this garbage. And the thing is, Neither do the people buying it. You know, the customers that are trying to fix their own phones, they don't they would rather pay 20 cents for quality. The people who are doing this as a business would rather pay that. We would like and I think that we can put together some sort of system where we grade these vendors on the quality of their products using, you know, online wikis or forums or just rating rating websites. There's many ways to do this rather than just saying, well, it's not the original, it's not from the original company, so it's counterfeit by there has to be an in between, and I, you know, I completely understand when people say they don't want to buy an iPhone that has a five dollar eBay screen because the five dollar eBay oh. screen sucks. You know, th when you hit O, it presses the P. They're all like, you know, the blacks are in black and the yellows are blue. It's terrible. Uh, but there has to be something in between that and go to the Apple Store if they will not help you or if there's not one in your country, you're screwed. Bye. And yeah, that's the the issue that a lot of people are forgetting um, in in regards to this is that. Um, is, is that it's not that Lewis is selling bad parts. It's that Apple refuses to sell the parts at all. Like it's, it's not an issue of, of yeah. gray, of, of there being a black market for, for black, for Apple parts. And, and Lewis is going around to Apple and, Oh, screw you, Apple. I'm not, if Apple sold the parts, Lewis would gladly buy them. Yeah. And like, if Apple and a markup, yeah. And, and third party manufacturers are allowed to make parts that fit the laptop or fit the specifications or whatever. I mean, you, you can't, you, you can't, there isn't a trademark on the shape of a gear or something like that. The trademark is on the brand of, of, of the producer, the, the, the source of the item. That's what it's on. So he has every right to have batteries made. We're just trying to figure out whether these batteries violated the trademark in some way. And I could even understand if Apple does not want to sell parts specifically. You know, there are certain parts that I don't sell. I used to have a company that sold screens. We were selling 1,200 laptop screens a day at some point between eBay, Amazon, and our website. And that business sucks. People would always buy the wrong screen, regardless of how much information you give them, just because they were hoping the cheaper one would fit their machine. They'd blow their backlight fuse. They'd mess up the cable. And then they would send the screen back cracked and get a refund. And it's aggravating. You know, I understand Apple not wanting to be in certain businesses. It's why on my website, like every, we sell all these different parts and we don't sell screens. I, there are certain things I just don't sell because I don't want to buy something for $40, sell it for $45, and then have to sell 10 of them to make up for one bad sale where somebody breaks it on their own and files a chargeback. Uh, but I understand them not wanting to be in the business of selling parts, particularly at all, much less the people who are not authorized. Uh, but th then the question becomes, well, if you don't want to do it and somebody else wants to do it, why can't they do it? Because, you know, people are saying that Apple should be forced to sell parts, and I can understand why they would not want to sell parts by themselves. Because, that you know, selling parts to the end user for products that are very difficult to repair in a society where you, all you have to do to get your money back is call the 800 number on the back of your credit card, that sucks. You've posted a link to your Discord in my Twitch chat. Your Discord is much better organized than mine. Uh, you can thank our community manager, Brandon, and our other moderators and, and, and community participants who uh, help keep it clean like that. Thank you, Brandon. Yeah, I, I almost never have time to log into mine, so it's a... I could help if you want. By the way, while there's a slight lull here, although I did make a comment on it in response to your comment to my video, I just wanted to say that I appreciate your graciousness and your willingness to um, accept my criticism and... You know, I didn't know who you were before uh, I recorded the video because all I was going on was one article. So perhaps that was a lack of due diligence on my part. So I appreciate your amenability. I don't even think it was that bad. I read through the comments. Oh, I forget your name. I feel bad about that. But I remember your voice and I remember the comment section. And I was reading it. And this is what I was saying about 
uh, you know, trying to end oppression versus reverse oppression and how you have to be careful there. You know, I don't like the, some of the things that Apple's done, but then I would read those comments and I was thinking, you know, okay, he's brought up some actually interesting points. And I saw that the video almost had more thumbs down than thumbs up. Every comment was terrible. And you brought up some interesting points. And I didn't really like the fact that all the comments you were getting were com just completely awful and terrible. Because what you were saying were questions that somebody should be asking and bringing up. You know, is it just that I'm being a paranoid loon when I say that it's a coincidence that this happened right by the CBC case? Perhaps I was. I was, you know, I got that letter. I was ridiculously aggravated. And I, I was just coming off of the, the, the increase in business from the CBC case and uh, all the comments coming from that. So, I mean, you asked good questions, and I, I felt bad that you're, that the comment section... Well, I could, probably could have done it better, and I thought you lowered the temperature, which was very gracious of you, and I appreciate that, so I just wanted to say that. Yeah, I, I hope... Thank you. And I hope you continue to express your opinions, and uh, regardless of what YouTube comment sections are. Mine is not exactly <laughs> pretty either. Well, I, 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 yeah, I, I, the, the comments were, were interesting for many levels, because, again, it was like there was a whole bunch of lack of nuance things which you know is like why i was happy to hear some of the stuff you're saying because it reflects a very thought out nuanced posture which i which i like so that was frustrating and then there's like some people that are like don't listen to this apple fanboy and i'm like i'm not really an apple fanboy do you even know if the guy owns <laughs> apple products i mean there's no yeah. way for... yeah, yeah and there's also like the fact that 90 percent of the youtube comments that you hate are probably from 12 year olds <laughs> yeah that's true you have to remember that it's not like completely yeah. an adult forum yeah, yeah don't go to YouTube comments for validation. I just have to say, general life rule: <laughs> if you need validation, please just just turn off comments on YouTube. Me and me and Leonard and Tactical often have a good laugh over the comments that we get on the channel. It's just like they're so ridiculous sometimes. It's it's great. It's like, oh, look at what this guy said. Delete. Like, <laughs> yeah. At least, at least Leonard has gotten to the point where he's like, well, I know this answer is going to make everyone really unhappy, so I'm just going to tell you in advance. This is not the answer yeah. you want to hear. Yeah, yep, we finally reached that point. I know my audience well enough now. The more recent fair use stuff we've done over, you, you say right at the beginning, you're like, you guys are going to hate me. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, just giving you the truth. And then, uh, yeah, and then sometimes... Um, like we'll put up something that that wasn't expected to be as controversial and the first few comments will come in and i'll be like okay we're not going back to that <laughs> just let it go walk away yeah there are, there are definitely some videos where i'm like i i can't look at any of the comments because then i'll look at all of the comments and i'm like i have stuff to do Someone and i don't want to like sit there and reply to everybody <laughs> Uh, yeah, I just I try to keep a clean comment section. All the all the stuff that looks like crap without an argument, I just usually wind up deleting. If somebody hates me but has a genuinely good argument and is not filled with vitriol, yeah. I keep it. But if it's just saying like you uh, you f tard whatever, it's just bye bye. Um, Leonard, I did want to make you aware of this. There are twenty four hundred people on Lewis's uh, stream, and Excellent. they all you are now a cat in their head. Just so you know, um, everybody <laughs> thinks that you are now a cat. Yep, I right, see. I, I I did see the uh, the, the the cat. Very Obviously, cute cat. Yeah, it, it's it's I an like angry kitty cat. cat. That's that's Blackberry when she was younger, but mad at me. Um, oh. And she, yeah, yeah, but I I didn't. I should have set up like dual camera and all that, but I, it's Sunday. Yeah, you're okay. It's Sunday. Next time. Yeah, a lot of people think that you're the cat. I am scrolling and I see that. Yeah, and many people are like, oh, your camera's frozen. I'm like, it's a picture. <laughs> it's not a camera. I, I, a, I admit a... I was one of the people who thought it was uh, it was frozen for a moment, only because I watched the live stream the other day when you were petting your cat. And so I kind of was like, oh, he's going to do the same thing. And then when I saw it was frozen, I was like, oh, hey, Lewis, your, your, your stream's frozen. Except that it was frozen <laughs> for so long and nobody was talking about it. I was like, I'm just going to hold my tongue for a moment. <laughs> Everybody in chat, it did not hold their tongue. Immediately typing, "Your Lewis, your your camera's frozen. Be careful. You have you have to fix it." It's like, no, it's not. It's a picture. It's a still. Picture. I don't have a camera. Yeah. I left the stand of my camera at work, so I have no place to put it. Well, do we have anything more to talk about? Do we want to hang out and uh, and chat about this, or do we want to? Um... I was gonna go through the the super chats that I have to see if I had any questions that were uh, directed it. at you. You still have to go to into work too, eh? Oh yeah, I, I got. I'm riding my bike to work right after this to go through the the queue. 
Do you have to create one? Well, can an ox and a red cat still walk together? What? <laughs> that uh, sounds like there's a whole a Aesop's better? fable behind that. Can an ox and a red cat still walk together, or have we all been reduced to an oxide free culture? Oxide free. Is there a joke in there? I'm trying to figure out what. Said, what I remember Rust some has ICE representative said to Motherboard that your batteries were analyzed and concluded to be counterfeit. What do you think about that? And I typed a response to that. So this, what they said is, a CBP spokesperson told Motherboard in an email, CBP officers and trade specialists detained the shipment and submitted samples to CBP's consumer products and mass merchandising centers for excellence and expertise. By the way, anytime the acronym of a name of a government, you can kind of tell how effective or intelligent a government agency is, inversely proportional to how long the acronym for it is. Consumer <laughs> products and mass merchandising centers for excellence and expertise. That's a yep, long one. Follows that rule. The agency's trade experts determine the batteries to be counterfeit. Uh, well, what is their definition of analyze and what is their definition of counterfeit? Like, is their definition of analyze, we saw a logo scratched off and it was going to an unauthorized person? Or is it, we opened it up and measured the cells and checked their chemical composition in contrast to the original? That's kind of what I'm really interested in. It sounds like a cookie cutter. Yeah. Uh, and plus, it sounds like a, a yeah. candor plot. Plus, plus their definition of counterfeit. Visual one. It's, we don't it's, actually it's know. Two second visual guess. What exactly their definition of counterfeit like, is. If the, yeah, I want to know. Like, was it a because if the bat if the battery chemical again, I don't think that they have the time or the the care to put the burden. Because if you have the power to seize them, regardless of what I think, I don't think that they're going to put the effort in to see are the cells of a different chemical composition or something than the yeah. original. It takes time to test batteries. It sounds like they Let's wouldn't see. take the time to test them. No. Uh, Lewis, but I, I am interested. <laughs> I'm sorry, what was your question? You said, uh, at what point do you own up? You, you just like, they're saying, oh, it's not an iPhone anymore. You're like, yeah, no, it's not an iPhone. It's a Rossman phone. Come buy one. <laughs> like, at what point do you do you become so famous that getting your phone fixed by Rossman is like a brand in itself? Let's you do know? it. I've had people actually ask me to put, to keep, like, there was this one guy who was sitting with me while I was doing a repair, and I said, I think I can make this jumper shorter. And he said, no, I like the long jumper wire on my board. I, I, I consider it an autograph. <laughs> so, definitely jumper wires i've had people take pictures of jump open their computers after we fixed them take pictures of the jumper wires and put them on instagram i thought that was really like cool. lewis rossman fixed my computer <laughs> yeah exactly i got the That's famous awesome. lewis rossman fixing my computer i've had people awesome. ask me to weld them some battery packs and send them to them just so they can say they have a battery pack made by me i said no but <laughs> <laughs> i think cool. it's really cool that I, what i find cool is the fact that people are okay with it with, with with let's say a jumper wire being in their computer just the fact because i think that somewhere at apple they like control over the system so much that the idea of a machine being out there with a jumper wire on it that wasn't put in there by them is just ah you know I, like i think it strikes somebody's ocd or sensibilities that that's yeah. there i like the fact that there's that the cut the consumer base is shifting to the point where they actually think it's cool that there's a wire inside their machine. It's not, is it going to look the same as the original or all this other stuff, that they think it's cool that there's a wire running around their board. Yeah. But yeah. I, I mean, I do think if you get a phone with a knockoff battery that dies at 30% and a home button that doesn't feel the same and a screen that looks like shit, I mean, like, I, I definitely don't support that type of refurbishing. I wouldn't say it's not an iPhone. I'd say it's a shitty aftermarket iPhone. Yeah. And the other thing is, uh, I think one of Apple's fears is that people are going to blame them when something goes wrong with it, yeah. uh, with the product. I don't think that they've... Uh, it's weird that a company that has created this amazing retail environment can be so out of touch with the customer experience, uh, how customers respond to experiences at the same time. I have, I have just had people show up, and I remember installing LibreOffice for this uh, kind person on a weekend one time and saying, look, you don't have to pay for the word license. She had lost her word license. Uh, and I said, look, you don't need to pay for a typewriter in 2016. And her GPU died a few weeks later. She didn't yell at Apple. Even though they had a recall program open for that machine at that time, she yelled at me. She came back and she said, ever since you did X, now it's been randomly crashing. And it was a 2011 15 inch with a bad GPU. On Apple's own website, their website will tell you we, you know, mea culpa, some of these models may experience GPU failures. We are replacing the boards for free until December of this year. And she still blamed me for it. So I don't, when people get something off of eBay and it works like crap, I think they're more inclined to say, I got this thing off of eBay. They put a knockoff, whatever, in it than actually blaming Apple. Or if a repair person fixes something and it dies, 
they're not going to blame Apple. They're going to blame the jackass repair person. No, that's blame. true. If it's true if that's what their last point of contact is, surely. But, you know, one of Apple's concerns is or might be that these products are being resold and now you have a phone that looks like an iPhone, but it's not. And yeah, so that might, you know, people are people are loath to blame themselves. Right. So they're going to find some point of friction. And since outrage tends to spread more than good things do, you know, the point one percent of people who are going to scream the loudest might hurt Apple's brand, and that's an Apple consideration. But, you know, by the same token, I think that people should have the right to repair their stuff. So there's there's points of tension here, and it's an interesting exploration. Well, I, I think if you play out some of those scenarios, some of them really aren't that different from scenarios we already know, like the car analogy. If I bought a phone that had been repaired by Lewis or a tablet or a laptop or whatever that had been repaired by Lewis and it failed and I didn't realize that it had been repaired by Lewis and I go to Apple and Apple opens it and sees a jumper wire or sees a, something resoldered or sees some leftover flux or something and realizes that it was repaired by some unauthorized repair center. I mean, that's something that, that car repair people do, that mechanics do every day. You know, oh, you know, you open your car and you, your engine's blown up or something and they, they tell you, oh, yeah, sorry, the used car you bought wasn't as, it wasn't in as great shape as you thought it was. Like, you, you should have gotten it at a, from a better retailer or a whatever. I also realized the same way that I'm aggravated with having 10 or 15 people come into the store every day saying, Apple told me this and Apple told me that. I'm sure that there are people that work for the Genius Bar for the actual refurbishers at Apple, for the higher ups at Apple that come that have customers come in every single day saying, this iPhone works like crap. And they open it up and there's flux in the board and they can see that somebody who doesn't has never soldered a BGA in their life has tried to like duct tape a LED driver to the board or something. And I'm sure that they have the same feeling I do, except in the opposite spectrum of we're sick and tired of these idiots that think they know how to work on our products, screwing them up and making us look bad. I'm tired of people coming to our store angry because of shit that these people have done. Screw it, shut it down, regardless of what you have to do, I don't care. Stop them from doing this. I'm, you know, I'm sure that there is somebody at an Apple store somewhere, if not multiple people, that have had that experience. Like we're sick and tired of these I fix and repair and you break I fix and all these franchise chains that hire uh, inexperienced people and pay them like shit. We're, we're tired of these people who don't know how to work on our products, destroying mm -hmm. them. Like, I, I'm tired of it. I don't care if customs is seizing their stuff. I don't care if they go out of business. I don't care if the customer doesn't have another option. They're better off buying a new one than having it taken to one of these dumbasses. You know, I'm sure that there's, I'm sure that we could have a conversation about this. Uh, yeah. Like, if I was able to sit down with one of those individuals, and we could probably go on for hours about the, the, the you know, the things that yeah. aggravate us and come to some sort of meaningful conclusion or meaningful compromise. It's just that it's never happened. Yeah. yeah. And as you point out, there's like, a lot of shitty repair services out there, a lot of people using crap, and a lot of people who make your make the repair industry look bad. And you're doing all this good work and using top quality components and you and you care. And then there's all these other people who are doing third rate work who are in some sense making the industry look bad. And you know, that's not your fault either. And it's like so the frustration gets spread all around. I mean, you have to point out the bad actors in your own industry. Yeah. You have to point out the people that, that suck um, and, or, or that are doing a bad job or that are screwing things up. You know, you can't just say oh, everybody in our industry should be able to do X without saying, yeah, but also these people that do this, that's disgusting. Or, you know, if somebody says, oh, I reflow graphics chips because I can make some money at it, uh, even though I know that they're going to fail in 60 days and I offer a 30-day warranty, you can't just turn a blind eye to that. You have to be willing to say, even if it makes you, uh, even if it draws negative attention to you within your community, you're doing, you're screwing your customers. You shouldn't do that. If you keep doing that, you should go out of business. And I hope you do. You know, because saying that is going to create animosity within the within your business. Because, but at the same time, if you're not willing to do that, then do you really have the right to advocate for the industry or to advocate for better conditions? And there are a lot of people that that care like you know jessa jones cares michael oberdick cares uh mark schaefer cares chris o uh, long cares but there are a lot of other people that will just uh turn a blind eye to people in their own industry their own group their own friends that know that they're doing something they shouldn't be doing just because they can make an extra buck at it and i could see the frustration there there has to be some kind of compromise yep <clears throat> or we'll Much just keep fighting like this forever i mean it's a... 
to time the goes on. Issue, first, we have to figure out what the facts are. Yeah. Because that's question one. What yep, exactly question is the one fact? is the facts. And then from there, we can try to figure out what the law is. So a lot of steps to go through. We have a lot yeah, of steps to go through. It's an interesting through. exploration. So that's going to be interesting. And we'll know more a little bit later this week. All right, here's Nico. And Ilsa will come as soon as she realizes that. Yep, here, we, here she comes. Oh, if you go to... And yeah, if you go to Leonard's page, you'll be able to see a doggy. Two doggos. And you can only see a cat on Lewis's, so clearly the superior yeah. screen is over on Twitch. And this is an <laughs> animated dog. He's moving. And Nico, the golden retriever, is so beautiful. He has crimps in his ear hair that look like they're professionally done or something. Um, Leonard assures me that he doesn't style his dog's hair every day. Do not, I promise. I swear. <laughs> But it does look like it. I mean, Nico slept with me a whole bunch of times, and I can attest to the fact that he literally rolls out of bed like that. Like, that's it. That <laughs> yeah, he's mouth a good boy. Microphone. Love it. Yeah, dog mouth sounds are okay. Brr. He's my go Renting for us. If you haven't noticed, the Patreon panel behind me is off, and it's because Patreon was down for a short period of time this morning. It just happened to be the exact period of time that I was updating that panel. And I did want to thank our Patreon supporters for the month of November. At the $500 level, we have Justin Rogers. Thank you very much, Justin. I will be in touch with you about the um, sponsor a video kind of thing. We'll talk to Justin about what he would like. Uh, and thank you to the $50 plus supporters, Jonathan Doe, John Steele, Gavin Barnard, Kyle Mudrock, Evie, Andy, Veriman, Dane, Sean McNamara, William Gonzalez, Michael Pierce, Perry Crisp, Richard Fournier, Spirit Bear, and Jan de Grey, and Jax Merrick or Yax Merrick or J-A-X Merrick. Thank you very much for your support at the $50 level, and I'll make sure that everybody else gets a good long crawl, the $5 plus supporters as well. So that's our show. Thank you very much for joining us. Have a great day. Have a great week, everybody. And we'll see you uh, with an update, I'm sure, as soon as I have an update with the, the Lewis Rossman situation. So have a good one, everybody. Love you all. Uh, bye.